A Mantecorp Farmasa, há mais de 50 anos, se mantém ao seu lado. Levando informação de marcas tradicionais e inovadoras. E mesmo nesse momento tão delicado, à distância, seguimos juntos, trazendo atualizações e conteúdos relevantes desse momento para você. Mantê-lo atualizado com segurança é nossa prioridade. Bem-vindo ao webinar Mantecorp Farmasa. Boa noite a todos. Antes de, de começar, vou pedir para o Murilo passar uma pequena vinheta do nosso, do nosso apoio, o apoio da Esportes, da SEC, da Sprat. Murilo, por favor. A Mantecorp Farmasa, há mais de 50 anos, se mantém ao seu lado. Levando informação de marcas tradicionais e inovadoras. E mesmo nesse momento tão delicado, à distância, seguimos juntos, trazendo atualizações e conteúdos relevantes desse momento para você. Mantê-lo atualizado com segurança é nossa prioridade. Bem-vindo ao webinar Mantecorp Farmasa. Bom, muito obrigado. Hoje nós vamos começar uma série de encontros da FEC. Com as, com as subespecialidades, então hoje é o encontro da SEC com a SBRAT, a SEC SBOT com a SBRAT, e, e nós vamos começar com o chave de ouro, né, com o doutor Fred Fu, o Fred Fu, ele, todos os que conhecem, é professor da, da, da Universidade de Pittsburgh, ele vai falar sobre 40 anos de LCA, anatômica individual, individualized, value based reconstruction. E depois, no final, de, de, no final da, da apresentação, ele vai abrir para questões. E depois o doutor André Pedrinelli, ele vai falar sobre dor no pós-operatório. Isso é mais uma conversa informal, para que a gente possa discutir os casos de, de dor no pós-operatório de reconstrução do ligamento cruzado anterior, né, os tipos de dor, e eu, eu acho que é para complementar a discussão. Então, eu queria agradecer em nome da SEC, do Francisco, presidente da SEC, do presidente da Esporte, Dr. Gleison, do presidente da Esprat, Cristiano Aurim, e eu vou falar inglês agora aqui para passar a palavra para o Fred Fu. Dr. Fu? Yes. Thank you Hello. very much for you know, Hello. Coming, coming virtually to talk for us. We are very glad to have you here. And Feel free to, to talk, to ask questions, and you can, after the talk, we will, we will start a, a section of questions and answers. Please, Dr. Fu. Okay, thank Go you ahead. very much. Can you hear me, Mario? You can hear me. Yeah, yeah right? You yeah. are here, fine. So this is a talk about what I've learned and many of the mistakes I make in the last 40 years, uh, learning about ACL. So, It's about anatomy, it's about variation, and also about doing the right thing for the patient. Value-based, do not waste money. Uh, if you focus on some very simple thing, you can benefit the patient and saving uh, a lot of cost. And like I say, I have many good friends in Brazil. I cannot show all the pictures right here, 
But uh, Pat Lewis was my, my first fellow back in the 80s. And of course, Lucio and uh, and Mario. And of course, Moises uh, visited me back in 92. And there are many others. Uh, we have almost, I would say, close to 100 Brazilian you know, visitor and fellows. And many of them are so good friends of mine and also very productive in terms of the research. Uh, I come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I look kind of like this, but this has now become this uh, UPMC Sports Center, it used to be a steel mill. And this is today's. This is uh, today. This is exactly how Pittsburgh is night. It's a really beautiful, uh, clean town. And this is where the sports center is. Uh, and, and also, this is a very clean environment. Even the Bald Eagle have now come back uh, to visit and live about two miles uh, from the sports center. And the sports center recently have been renamed um, after myself. So means that I have to work really hard to make sure this is uh, been something good and uh, for the patient. Uh, my department is 100. 10 years old, uh, I'm the fifth chair, and there are many good, my mentor is Professor Ferguson. Uh, he taught me everything I know, and I could never be as good as uh, he was. He said, just do the right thing, and take good care of your patient, and they will take good care of me, of all of you, not just me, all of you. Wow. Uh, I can hear some noises. Uh, I don't know what happened. So yeah, anyway, uh, please. Uh, okay. So essentially, in 40 uh, years, I have done quite a bit. I get some award, many papers, about 500 in ACL, more than 8,000 ACL surgery, uh, 10 million dollars grant, more than 800, you know, thousand deals for Vimeri and an uh, age index of 130. Uh, but just really, it's not that important how much I did. The more important thing is there's a lot to learn. And I'm still learning every day from you, from everybody else, from my fellows and residents. Now, some history, just so this I've done about 38 years ago. And, uh, and this is a lady I did open surgery. See how open it is? It's called vascular patellar graft. She still did pretty good function uh, 30 years later. And this is the daughter, which I did recently for PL augmentation. Now, this is another patient of mine did 34 years ago. Did the extraticular first that failed. So I know that some of you like extraticular. It's, uh, it's been, been done a long, long time ago. It's not really the answer for the ACL. ACL is the only rotational control of the knee that's important. I don't want to, uh, out of part of uh, secondary. So this failed and then I do intraticular. And uh, recently I did a daughter too, about, you know, 30 you know, la later. So it's just did a regular uh, ACL on her. Now this is interesting. This is a doctor, orthopedic surgeon, who have an ACL and a stricticular. And it, it, it really is so painful with the compartment of treated changes that he get a total knee. So sometimes we do too much. <laughs> we over constrain and we're going to get problems. So be careful. Don't do too much. Just do the right thing for the patient. Now, the last one I want to show you, this is the more modern arthroscopic surgery site in 86. This is a transdebial BTP, uh, allograft patella tendon, 89. He played 14 years in the National Football League, a very famous player. She can athletic changes. And the head scan 20 years later show the tunnel up to be very good. In fact, this is not anatomical. So in other words, you can play sport with a wrong anatomy in reconstruction, but you're gonna pay a price by having a treated change later. Now, I think that you are more interested in doing how as a surgeon, but to be consistent, you have to ask why and what why you do it and what happened, okay? This is more important because I have been in this ACL study group for 40 years now, and Moises Cone will be a president. And we tend to do how, and you can see in 40 years, we haven't made a lot of progress. Things just keep going around. For example, we do extraticular, 
30, 40 years ago now is coming back a little bit. I'm not sure we are doing the right thing. And 30 years ago, we did artificial ligament, but right now it's coming back a little bit too. So again, there are many things that we done years ago and now it's recycle. Means that maybe not we're doing the right thing. Now, this is important definition of the ACL. The ACL is dynamic, it's not static, it's biological. There are bundles that work with bone morphology. This is important. The bone morphology we know right now is more two dimensional, but we need three dimensional uh, morphology to dictate how the ACL works. And because ACL is living, there's big variations and there's also aging. Why aging is important? Because we look at cadaver study, which is done in older cadavers. So we need young cadavers to understand how young athletes work. So if you remember this definition, and then every time you do ACL and think about it, you're gonna make progress in the next 20, 30 years to make it a better, you know, for the patient. Now, if you look at this, this is a dissection me and Paul Galano done in Pittsburgh. It's beautiful dissection, no question about it. But unfortunately, these are not realistic. These are not real ACL, how it works, because the real ACL is dynamic. For example, ACL is bigger on top on the femoral side, small in the middle, and bigger on the femoral side. And there's variation too. Sometimes it's bigger on the femoral side than the tibial side. And I think in, in surgery, we want to reconstruct a percentage of the insertion site. And using the tibial site as a landmark, we like to do 50 to 80%. Why 50? 50 because less than 50 will be too weak. Now, not more than 80 because more than 80, maybe it's too big. You're gonna lose motion. The notch, you know, you know, unless you do not plasty, which can regrow. Not plasty uh, is not a good thing to do. Dr. Moises Cohen showed that years ago, it caused more problem, more pain, discomfort too. So essentially you have to have a balance to really match the graph uh, to the patient. Now this is a beautiful micro CT done by Stefanini, who is my fellow back in, you know, 93 or four. And you see it's self complicated the insertion site from the femur. And you can see it become a septum. The septum is where the bundles, look at that, this is the, septum where the vascularity comes, and this is the AM and the PL bundle right there. Now we know the ACL as a static structure, but the ACL is dynamic like this. Henry Mankin in the 60s told us that the cartilage is dynamic. Every time you walk, it squeezes together and it's, it's like a sponge comes out. So as the ACL, the ACL have no isometric. When you run and play soccer, play football, the ACL squeeze together and stretch out. Now, when we study biomechanics, we know the ACL fail at 8% of stretch, but this is only one aspect of the ACL. When the ACL squeeze together, it allows the blood supply to come in, and it also store initial energy for them to be stretched out. So it's a very dynamic structure. Now, just putting the ACL and this knee on a robot and go through a six degree of freedom and using a laser scan, you can see how complicated the ACL move. Very complex. It's not like a ribbon, as some people say. It's definitely a complex, multi dimensional movement and allow blood supply to come in to revascularize it when relax and stretch out in the extreme. Now uh, this uh, our machine in Pittsburgh is, is a is a very expensive machine. It's about 3.5 million US dollar to build. And he, with that, you can study many things about in vivo kinematics. We have done now probably 500 patients, which should change. So essentially, for example, we can look at the intradistance between the ACL when you run, for example. Now I told you the intradistance change almost 20 to 30 percent. This is why I tell you there's no isometry. The squeezing together and coming out every every time you run and play sport is important to the health of the ACL. When it comes together, the blood supply will come in and revascularize the ACL, allow it to heal, to maintain its everyday life. And of course, if you stretch out to the extreme, then it prevents from motion and prevents it from tearing. 
So if you tear it, the extreme, then you may need to fix it. Now, there are a lot of talks about indirect direct fibers. Uh, in fact, it's only from two papers, one from London and one from Japan, only in cadavers. Unfortunately, I think they, they're looking at the wrong thing because direct fibers may be important, but indirect is also important. When you're young, like this, this is young, young cartilage, direct and fibers fiber are all important all over the instruction site. So you so you win a teenage shoe. When you get old, you only have direct fibers left. So because at an age, 80 years old, you do not need the squeezing and running around. So he said that essentially for the ACL to work, you need all this fiber. So in other words, the whole insertion site is important. There is no more important part of the insertion site. For the ACL to compress and come out, you need a lot of give, much like a high riser in Tokyo. When you have an earthquake, this sway back and forth, and this is how the ACL works. Now, biologically, the ACL is important because the membrane will envelop the ACL, and the membrane will form a septum right here, and the septum will divide the ACL into bundles, AM, PL, intermediate sometimes, and you can see, and within this septum, Dr. Hewitt and myself 15 years ago, or even longer, discovered both in fetus and in adult, in doing patient surgery, there are stem cells, nerve fibers in there. So this is your lifeline to your everyday usage of the ACL, basically. You can see, you can see the vascularity coming in right there. You can see beautiful blood vessels coming in. Now, blood vessels is described by Anosky in 82 to show the vascularity of meniscus is peripheral on our side, but very strong vascularity on the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, and this is right here. So vascularity come in and become the septum, like I say, the A cell need to live every day. And, and if you do surgery, we need to preserve this area really carefully. In fact, the A cell and the lateral meniscus overlap 35%, and the A cell insert into the lateral meniscus in, within direct fibers right here. So the vascularity come in. So I, I, I personally, when I do surgery, I'm very careful about this area. You can see the septums, vessels coming in right here. See all the blood vessels right there. Now, if you cut the insertion site of the tibial site in a real patient doing a proscope, you can see a blood supply coming in right here. Beautiful. Now, this is a dissection done by Mario Ferrate almost 20 years ago, and we look at almost 100 of his fetus, one day old fetus. Uh, we find two bundles, and we also find the vessels coming in through the lateral meniscus, like just like that, coming in. This is AMPL, and this is a 17 years old doing surgery, uh, meniscectomy. You can see the blood vessels, same vessels coming in. And you can see the blood vessels right there. And this is your lifeline to your ACL. And from top is the lateral genital artery coming in. And this is older specimen, 67 years old, and you don't see vessels anymore because uh, they are all now degenerative changes and the peer bundle start to go and first. And this is why if you dissect older specimen, you may find a lot of degenerative changes. And you may think that the ACL is, is a different structure. It's not. It's just when you operate on young people like this and fetus like this, old people are a little bit different. Aging is important. Recently, we have ultrasound. We've been using ultrasound for about six years now. I do ultrasound on every patient with turn A cell, uh, look at size of the graph, uh, look at size of the uh, insertion site sometimes, look at extraticular injury. And now this new machine we bought, very expensive one, uh, can look at you know both vascularity and elastic property, and we can see the bundles. We can also follow heal healing. For example, initially the graph are highly vascularized, and within as time goes along, the the vascularity become less and less, become like the normal side, because in the ultrasound we can look at the normal knee and the injury knee. 
Game, this is one of Mario first dissection. I remember. And uh, this is Pokalano holding this tiny fetus in his hand. And you can see there's two bundles, and this is 30 years old. And this is a 18 years old ballerina with a tournament. And case, you can see how big the PL bundle are. Now, some PL bundle are tiny, but this is very big. So I think that most people do not pay attention to the PL bundle. But I'm just telling you, you have to pay attention to everything. Paul Galano said, look at nature. Don't create nature and preserve nature. All right, so you have to pay attention to everything. Everything means something. So just don't ignore it because you don't want to do something technically. Because a cadaver will not make a conclusion of what is more important fibers within the ACL. Now, this I've done a long time ago, about 25 years ago, to show the AM bundle and the PL bundle how it works. Basically, the AM, uh, so called more same length, but the PL become loose in, in flexion and a lot, lot of rotation. The rotation depends on the bone morphology. So in other words, the morphology of the bone is more important than the ligament. The morphology of the bone will dictate how your knee moves. The ligament is just add on to guide this morphology move. For example, in normal human being, the rotation at nine degrees varies from nine degree to 27 degrees. This is how much variation that there are. You can see there's vesicularity right here. Beautiful two bundles. One bundle tear in some cases. Most ACL are complete tear, complete tear, but sometimes you can have one bundle tear about six, seven percent. Now this important study done by uh, Paulo Arrigo, uh, you know, from Brasilia, as well as uh, Savio Wu. This is a very important study. Now this study essentially tell you if you do a cell in a cadaver model we use a robotic technology right here if you do anatomical double bundle for example you restore if you do it perfectly you're going to restore the kinematics perfectly so in, in other words you balance the knee perfectly but on the other hand this is as important inside of forces in other words if you put the acl in the wrong position the inside of force of the acl do not return and this force going through the knee is the same. So in other words, the force will go through the meniscus and the cartilage higher than through the ACL. This is what Paulo Raguto say that, okay? I hope Paulo is right here listening too. So in other words, if you do the ACL not anatomically, you're gonna have more problem with the cartilage and meniscus. This is a study already done by the Moon Group in America to show that you have more surgery at six years post-op if you don't do anatomical reconstruction. Now, these are two examples. This is both done by me. I don't mind sharing you this horrible vertical graph I did almost 25 years ago And this lady. Now, luckily, she's not a sport person. She only played tennis occasionally. And she came to see me about 25 years later with some knee pain. I just injected her and she was fine. She lose a little bit of motion, but she's not complaining too much. But you see how bad the graph is. In other words, this graph, you not see the graph. See the forces, and the patient lose some motion, but she's not really high maintenance, so she is okay. Now, how about this one? This is a professional player. I did him anatomically beautifully, but if I let him get to play too early in six months, for example, if the graft is not healed, he have a good chance of retain. Why? Because now the inside of force return to normal. No, oh, where's the needle? Uh, so we turn to normal. Oh, okay. Now, so inside the force, we turn to normal. So it means that the force is now not higher, but normal. In, in other words, if you do a A cell in the wrong position, it's hard to tell this A cell. It's lopping. <laughs> it doesn't tear. You're going to ruin the con down and the meniscus. But if you do it like this. Now, how do I know that? Because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I did something like this. And the time my God, I looked at the MI6, it looked fantastic. I let the patient play and boom, he taught it. He's one of the best players on my team. And now I learned that basically, the inside toe force is important as a kinematics in this case. So remember, Paulo, thank Paulo Rigo from Brasilia for this study. Now the next level of study is morphology of the ball. And we have to thank Owen Lovejoy 
and Sheila Ingram. I hope you're listening, Sheila. I don't know who she is, but she has spent three years with us, and she did all of an animal and a paleontologist. Now, this is Lucy. Lucy is 3.2 million years old, and basically Lucy have two bundles. Lucy have a resin rich. Lucy AC is right here like modern human being because she is an upright walking thing that re resemble human being or only four feet tall, tiny, tall. And he is the one who taught me, basically, the bony morphology dictate the ligament, not the other way around. And this is why people talk about AL right now. It's not important because Jeff Troy told me that human bone morphology. More important thing is the crucial ligament. The crucial ligament is not like a finger. <laughs> The knee allow you rotation. The finger have all the extraticular ligament. That's the rotation. Because the more faulty of the finger, that's not allowed us to have. Okay? So you have to understand that. Now, animal study. This is in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But this is a bear. I took this myself. I saw him. It's shifting. Look at that. It's a... Boom. Right. So when the bear go to be examined by the vet in the zoo, Sheila and I will go in. Sheila is right here with me, and uh, we examine the near bear. Sheila is right here. Look at that. Sheila is right there, and we can look at rotation. Sheila's. Thank you so much, Sheila. And when the and also this is mantra monkey. Sheila was there too, uh, and this is AM intermediate PL is torn right there. By the way, I was 10 days post neck fusion. I did that, you know, surgery, and uh, he came back quite good. So follow up, you know, on, on this uh, mental monkey. So when these people go to sleep, we examine them, look at rotation. Lion, polar bear, cotton top monkey, tiger, which is 28 species of animal. And when they die, we get the bones, examine the crucial, like we look at the bear, real narrow notch. Very narrow north. Look at how big the meniscus are in a kangaroo. Very big. Okay. So triple bundle right here. And we do CAT scan on the bone on every one of them. We have like 200 specimens. Biggest series in the world. And look at that. This is all the insertion site of the triple bundle. One, two, three. So it's, it's almost silly for people to tell me there's no bundles exist. There's specific bundle exists in the animal world and in human being. And as we're just part of a continuum. And the ligament is only there to serve the function of the morphology of the bone. This is an, uh, the other thing is the morphology is three dimensional. And the tibial stop is two dimensional, is high tibial stop is three dimensional, very unstable, turn ACL. So if you cut the ACL in a dog, for example, within six weeks, because of such a high tibial stop, this dog will develop osteoarthritis. So, in other words, the ACL is part of the whole equation. The bone ball falls to take the ACL how to move and also dictate wear and tear in the knee too. So remember that. All important. So if your TV stop is high, you may predispose yourself to osteoarthritis too. Now this is about evolution too. This is the lemma. Lemma is the most primitive primate. Look at that two bilateral colonial ligament. Gorilla. Chimpanzee, human being, don't. So this is the lowest level of primate that will require two ligaments on our side. And this is why people ask me, do AL exist? I say no, <laughs> because look, I said, it doesn't exist beyond this kind of animal structure. It's, they're capsule, thickened capsule, but no true ligament in any way. If there's ligament, you can definitely see it. Okay, and uh, you can see how thick the meniscus is there too. So form follow function. Look at that. This is two bundle. This is three bundle in a gorilla. And this is actually Mario gave it to me. This is three bundle. Human being from Brazil. Gain this a gradation, how it works. We don't even understand how it works in, a, in this bundle. But this vascularity could go in. Maybe you need more plus apply. Maybe bigger bundle, maybe more rotation. Morphology of the bone, you can see this is human. By looking at the gorilla, you can already know that they have more rotation. And this is Schiller examining the knee right here. 
90 degree rotation. Human is rare, rarely from 9 to 27 degrees. Gorilla need to climb the trees and uh, chase after other gorilla yeah. and just a lot of rotation. Form, follow function. This is why we need to look at every A cell and morphology of the bone. In other words, I'm going to challenge all of you. There's no two A cells the same. A cell is like our fingerprint. Every A cell is unique. Some are bigger from top than the bottom. But most of the time, the bottom, the tibial side is bigger than the femoral side. But 10% this is bigger. I don't know why. But if you look at cadaver study, nobody knows it's bigger on top. Nobody knows because they only have limited number of specimens. But we did thousands of intra op measurements. All right. So, in other words, if you want to do a one size fit all surgery, you're going to in failure of 10 to 15% failure. This is why, if you're going to correct 10 15% failure, it's a value based surgery. You don't need to pay anything. Look at nature, look at anatomy. Pick the right graph, put it in the right place. For example, some PO bundles are bigger. Put it more anteriorly. Okay? You change it. Don't put it on the AM area all the time. Now, if the notch is long and narrow like this, the ACL is going to be long and narrow too. This is a long 18, but only 10. So if you want to do a PTP and you have 10, you may lose motion on this one, for example. Most of the ACL are like this. Old full ship young people. And like I say, Sipo, my former fellow, think it's all shoe shape. It's not true. Look at that. This is like this. And young people. And when you, when you get older, or if you're sick, you're going to get degenerative changes. If you turn a long time for a ton ACL for a while, you're going to get degenerative changes. So you, this is a acute ACL within two weeks. This is how it looks. Okay. And with this, this is a very big size old full ship ACL. Variation. Just if you look at the surgical MI, and you can measure easily. The smallest we measure actually is about eight. The biggest one we measure is, um, let's see what's it. Oh, yeah, it's about 25 or six. So it's three times differences. Look at this frog, it's variation. There are many frogs. Look at the variation. Sometimes the PL bundle is bigger than the AM. Most of the time the AM is 60%, but sometimes this is 60% too. Now, more recently, we measure it in three-dimensional and publish it with the confirmation with intra op measurement. So we measure it one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. And with a ruler, which is the cheapest instrument, $50, you can use it for years, never break. And with that, you can have a bar graph. And with this, you can see what kind of graph you need and what technique you need. For example, if the search is really big, you may need to a double bundle. Now, in the old days, I do a lot of double bundle in this range, but now we know that from our paper, these are the same. If you do single or double bundle in this range, your results are quite equal. So you don't need to do double bundle. But here you may, but you need to understand and do it. And if you're going to do a double bundle in this range, you're going to have failure. It'll be too big, you're going to lose motion. Okay? Now, I'm just cutting this. This is a kill injury knee. Again, this is uh, show you how the TBO side look like. Look at that. This is how it look like. This is no shoe shape. This is a beautiful oval shaped structure. This is how a young, you know, 15 years old female ACL look like. Dissection and cadaver, wrong, because they only see this AM bundle right here. But you can miss the whole PL bundle right here. Everything is important. Another one. Right here, you can see, again, you can see beautiful oval shape. This is 17 years old male. And in other words, if you're gonna do a one size fit all work with the company, try to use an instrument, you don't. You have to look at everything and measure it and decide where to put your ACL. Of course, this is the meniscus. On one side, you do not want to compromise the blood supply coming in here too. This is where your overlap of the meniscus and the ACL is right here. You can see the blood supply is right here. The vessel is coming in. Variation, AMPL, different sizes. I did thousands of cases now. And if you get old, this PL substitution. This is femoral side again. 
So no, not everything is just like AM is the most strongest. Look at that, this one is a QA function. This one probably can be repaired. So, so this is exactly how it, it's an awful shape right here. And, and every fiber is important. There's no more important fiber. This is much bigger. This is unusual. This is almost half, half the north size. Okay, usually it's about 25 to 35%, but this is big. So you can have many choice of your ACL right here. Okay. Sometimes ACL smile at you too. Now I'm holding on a PL bundle. This is quite strong. You can see right here. AM and PL with the septum right there, strong. And this is another one. The PL is bigger than the AM in this case. So don't ignore it. This one is a bigger PL bundle than the AM bundle, okay? This is very sizable. So in other words, the notch is important, three-dimensional. If you can operate on this with a 10 BTB, it failed because this is too big. I revised this, I revised almost 50, 60 patients like this all over the world, some from very good places because the doctor only do BTP. They don't understand, this is too big. In fact, they usually revise it with a 11 BTP allograph. This is the only 11 high. Now there's two cases, both mine, I put it in the wrong place. It should be over here, see the resin bridge right here? It should be over here. But this is good. But if you put it in the wrong place like this, nobody knows because just like the lady I showed you earlier, it survived. And it's going to give you wrong kinematics and going to get wear and tear in the knee. Okay? Your variation, if your ACL insertion site is here, your graph should be a little smaller, about 50 to 80%. Now, 50, if you get a graph, ideally, I like to do 70 to 80. If I can, but sometimes you don't get what you want because the graph may be small. But this is why we need to look at the graph. What kind of graph is available with the right size for you? And we can measure to ensure reading size on a TPO size. This is an example of a small graph for a big insertion site. Only give 30% of this insertion site. So, so this patient failed. The first time she kick a football. First time. This is the right size, about 80% right here. Now, like I say, there's variation. This is a very small graph, but this patient has a small insertion site. So almost 80% right here is really good. In fact, I just talked to this patient yesterday. She should now five years post off. She played everything. And she is mining 15 hyperextension. This is a very big insertion site. 12 graph, give you 60%. This is a double bundle, even bigger. Biggest graph, bold graph, and it's only give you 55%. This is a, you know, one bundle augmentation give you 100%. This is AM and tech, PL gone. And this is, you know, a preservation. So those are given more insertion site. And sometimes you can repair too, real rarely. I know there's a big push in the world to repair. Most of this repair, not real repair. They are putting a drill holes in and putting some artificial equipment in to do it. I think the real repair is put sutures in with some fibrin cloth repair directly to insertion site. So how do you do pre-op graph measurement? You can measure the quad tendon with the MI. You can see the thickness. You can see the length. Also, you can use the ultrasound probably to look at the length too. You can see the thickness of a patella. So if the thickness is less than 14, it's very dangerous to take a the bone ball. So you can measure that. You can see, see the thickness of the patella tendon, the length too. And with this MRI, you can look the size, inclination, and also the length of the graph. The variation of this is 25 to 45. So 41 is pretty long. So you need a longer graph. You have a hamstring, you may not be able to triple it, for example. Ultrasound now, we've been doing for six years now. We can look at pre-op size of the hamstring. We published it already. It's quite reliable, not 100%, but at least it gives you some idea you have a big or small hamstring. So if there's more hamstring, I would be very cautious, maybe not to use it. But I also look at the quad tendon, the, the, the length, as well as the quality of the graph. Patellar tendon too. So if there's a patellar tendinopathy, 
we may not use the patellotomy gel. And I have a case from China, come from China, a patient have pretty bad quadriceps tendinopathy, so I end up not doing that. He's only 21 years old. Now, if there's some MI, we have, you know, like study a long time ago, this is oblique surgical view, oblique coronal view. You can see the ACL beautiful two bundles right here, the septum. This is AM, and this is PL right there. This is hemorrhage in the PL bundle right here, in the patient AM. The patient is my secretary. She fell from a treadmill. Uh, no, no hemorrhage, and particularly just hemorrhage in the ACL, very painful. It recovered about one month. This is a complete tear of the PL bundle right there. This is a tear of the AM, partial tear of the AM bundle. This is the only case that I do some PRP in that. And uh, as, as I inject the PRP in, I see it leak out. So I don't think I, I can keep the PRP there. So I did not use it anymore. You can see the definitely on this oblique wheel, the uh, tear. This is a AM, this is PL, this is a septum. You can see the tear. Now look at this, which is a complete tear. If you look at this, you cannot tell if it is oblique surgical field. But if you're going to use the coronal or oblique or coronal field, you can see this is a partial tear. But this is a complete tear, right? Here. Examination is consistent with that. Okay. So in this case, we let it heal. We follow the healing on this one, and it's pretty successful. Look at that. You can see only partial tear now become healed, right? Now, how about this one? This one come from in our city. He won a double bundle. I examined him, and he was quite stable. So I say, why don't you wait? And then do the MI later, it heal. So it can heal some stem cells in there. It's a balance between the cytokines and the stem cells. This is another case. The patient won healing. No, no surgery. Uh, and so I, and he's quite stable. So I follow him, and he healed completely about one year later. You can see the healing on this oblique view too, beautiful healing. Now, how about this one? I'm not telling you that you should go let all this heal, but it can happen once in a while, and repair can be a possibility with a small indication. I think more, no more than 5%. So this patient came to see me with a torn ACL, unstable, but he had no time for surgery. So he come back one and a half year later with a complete healing of the ACL. So it can occur, but rarely, maybe one or two cases a year, I've seen. So the ACL is complicated, but you should just focus on the ACL. If you look at the ACL and just want to do surgery, you need to think outside of the box. In other words, you have to look at the, you know, the, you know, the morphology of the bone, the meniscus, the vascular supply, neurovascular, extraticular, all those other things. So that if you think of all those things, then you can do a complete ACL, be 100% ACL surgery. Now about, about aging. Some people a long, long time ago already told us, if you're gonna look compare 20 years old versus 80 years old, the strength is five time differences. By the time you're 80 years old, about 80% of ACLs are, are gone. <laughs> so this is uh, Mario Ferretti dissection. Fetus, one day old fetus, this is 30 years old, and this is a 80 years old. You can see the fatty changes right there. And if you do a dissection, kick out fatty changes, you will look at a, you turn a bundle to a ribbon. But this is not how the ACL look like. And you become a C-shaped structure in social science. This is how. Now this is all the study done recently from different parts of the world, from Japan, from Europe. And now they have a pretty good number here, but most of them small numbers. And they're older, even 100 years old. This is an NIH study we did. It's, the average age is 21 years old for surgical care. Even this one from us is younger, but not good enough because I, our finding is only nine patients. I will not trust. I would need a thousand patients, you know, and I did that already. So, so eight patients, I would never believe the direct fiber is important. Eight patients, old patients. Now, this is just just come out. Remember, I told you the ACL changes with ages and the APL degenerative. It's just a published uh, this week in uh, ESCO Journal and from Barcelona. 60 patients. I mean, 60 cadaver, one young, one group younger, as young as 19 years old, 
that group of 50 years and older, exactly, they find exactly what I told you, oval shaped young people and C shaped only in old people because the peer bundle they find is, is dead, it's gone, fatty changes. And now we have histology to show that the same way, too. We're doing this histology to show that. Now, there are two of my Japanese fellow, same age, 40 years old. One have no hair. This is only the AM5 left. This is the PL is all gone. And this is all the AM PL direct dental fibers right here. So I would say the study we do, they are well men study, but they are fragile because they are a small number, old cadaver study. And the conclusion is they want to do a one size fit all surgery. Good for the company, but bad for the patient. If you do this, you're going to lose 15% of your result. And this is what you have to do other things to make it up. ALL, bracing, all those things, okay? But I'm just telling you, if you follow this principle, you probably do not need to do many of those. You may have some indication, but not too many. For example, in the extraticular, I will only do it when your graph is compromised, is it weak? Or if the IT band is not quite you know, intact. If the capsule is torn, it will heal by itself. So my indication for extraticular is less than 5%. So double bundle used to be a technique 20 years ago when uh, people visit with me, but now it become a concept. And you need to individualize every cases. You have to look at all this possible or a graph and look at all the structures and try to match the social site on the TPO 50 to 80% with all this graph. Now, if this is a hamstring graph, Two years post swap, you can see the vascularity came back like two bundle. Now, so all the structures you put in a graph, and it, if you let it heal properly. Now, if you want to get laid back to the spot too early, all of a sudden you may disrupt the healing process. You're going to take time. Then it's going to come back to two bundle because it's nature. Okay, so you have to really remember that. I know you want to get the patient back soon, but sometime. Times is important to let biological link to occur. This is a 21 years old BDP I did. Become two bundles again, AM and PO symptoms right here, vascularity right there you can see. Again, it's a concept, individualized, anatomical. You can do single bundle, you can do double bundle, one bundle augmentation, Remember the sufficient, maybe repair, non operative. So the ACL surgery become fun. Again, you can look at the size, length, uh, and then you can also do individualized rehab. So this six thing can be applied to 100% of ACL surgery. So I have six choices every time I open. Kind of fun. For example, this is a ACL. This is a post op. This is the length. This is the inclination angle. This is the other side. The meniscectomy, you can compare the length. So this is quite good. I would give myself a good grade. But sometimes it doesn't match. You know that you didn't do a good job. This is easy part. You're going to do one size fit all. This is what I do in the 90s. When Moises visit me in the 92, I do maybe 5, 10 ACL a day, less than 30 minutes each, one size fit all, same graph. Trans TPO very quick, but then you're going to miss this failure right here. It can be failure because of osteoarthritis, failure because of other reason, but there are many failures that I've seen. And if you want to do a fit result, you have to look at the federation, be 100% ACL surgery. So I understand anatomical, but it's not the same every cases. You look at variation, every case is different. So anatomical, multiple, mutual, death feeling is, oh, I'm going to do it exactly the same way. I want to do the more important fibers, like you say, but they don't know. Everyone is different. And if you're going to do this concept, you're going to save people a lot of money, a lot of time, less revision, more success. Guarantee you that this is completely without any cost. I know company will push you to do more surgery, new things you don't need to you can do the same technique old technique you can just pay attention to the size variation you can use different graph and you can improve your result 
by 10, 15% easily right there. So in other words, if you do ACL anatomically, you, you cannot do the native dimension cognitive orientation. This is biological, but you can restore the insertion size. Size, if you want to repair it, you should repair it directly. Don't drill holes, okay? But for a graft, you need to drill holes, tunnels and there. So you can do all the same. This is a very small insertion site. It's not very small, it's a small one. 8.5 graph. Look at a beautiful graph right here, anatomical. Look at the size, 75%, 65% anatomical. Whole fold shape on the thermal side, medial drilling, and tunnel rung on this size. Now, this is the interesting case. This patient have minus 15 hyperextension. And she is the smallest insertion site I've seen in my life. Insertion is right here. Right here. Okay. Six millimeter graph, give it 80%. So should you pay it an eight? I did not give it a six. In other words, this is a six graph. This is a post-op MRI. Beautiful size, and this is a minus 15 hyperextension. So, to to save the problem of hyperextension, it's very simple. It's very simple. You just do the anatomical reconstruction on the patient. Basically, if the graph is small or the insertion is small, you just need to look at the insertion site and reproduce it exactly the same. Now, this is a 21 years old with a very big insertion site. So we did a very big size, right right here. 67% for 11.5 graph right here. It's very big cautious tendon right here, you can see. Now this is even a bigger one, double bundle reconstruction. 81%, 61% right here. So this is good. Now by the way, the two bundles have to heal together. The AM and PL cannot be independent. So if you put an AL in, if you see a gap here, you should not let them play. It, it, I put a five in club in between to let them heal faster. It takes six to nine months to heal this. So a double bundle means that it's stronger. You need to let it heal to become strong together in the right size. One point bundle augmentation. This is AM and tech, PL tear right there. AM and tech, PL tear right there, you can see. This is the gap seal, so you let it heal a little bit longer. In this case, you can see the PL tunnel. You can see the follow of the torn graph at two weeks, at four months healing. Look at the high intensity at one year and three years. You can see it take a long, long time to heal together. Preservation is important, I think. It's hard to prove it clinically at this moment, but there are vascularity and nerve, and this is a, you know, AM, a PL tear, but it's a good distal stump. Can put a graph in, the remnant, you can see right there. This is a repair case, just repair it directly with some fibering cloth directly on such and side. Do not drill holes, do not put artificial thing in there, do not put matrix, save you money. If you need to put all the thing, you may, may as well do a graph. I know people pushing it, company pushing it, but don't do it because this is not worth it. Because the graph is great, okay? And people say, oh, you repaired, you're gonna go back sooner. It's not true, okay? I have people come back real soon too with, with regular surgery, but this is something I did not advertise. Again, don't do one size fit all surgery. Look at all the possibility. And you're gonna improve on it yourself. Now, what did I do? In the last 15 years, I published three major studies. This is a Houston Award, the best paper in HSM, level one study, followed by a level two showing the size. This is a you know a bigger, bigger insertion site, you double bundle, smaller one bundle, so the same result. And just recently we published, we uh, submitted the level one study and a $3.5 million study with the probably most detailed study of Asia in the world with both kinematics and clinical result. And both of this free study show one thing, all prospective randomized trial, 450 patients, young active people for 15 years, and only 5% graph failures in three to five year follow-up. 
So if you have 15% failure, something's wrong with your surgery. You have to ask why, not because you need to do extraticular or other thing in it, okay? Because you just say maybe you're not the right size, you need to change it to a quad tendon, whatever it is, okay? And sometimes you have to do things, but not every time. Now, if you're gonna look at insertion site, this matter. So we have tried to see how to improve on insertion site measurement. For example, by looking at the other side with the MI, but interestingly, what we find is even the left and right side are not the same. Normally the left and the right side are only 85% of the, you know, overlap. So this is why it's so much variation around. This is a strong system for you. You can, in JVJS, we wrote it. It took eight years to write this paper. Essentially show that you can score yourself how good you are anatomically. I can say I, I am the best surgeon, but I may not be anatomical. We just published a paper today in the ESCO journal and our journal too about our international consensus. You can put it on too. So basically, to show the same thing, you need many techniques to look at being anatomical. Free portals, ruler measurement, MI, X-ray, CAT scan, post up, those kind of things. This is a study done at Duke to show that if you don't do things anatomically, even in one year, there are much more thinning of ACL. In that MI showed that there was cartilage damage. Now this is a study done by Conantry and myself, anatomical instruction and two years follow up, and we preserved the cartilage, and in about 10% of the cases, the cartilage actually became thicker. So definitely is control protective. Now we did a study recently to look at Minimal 10 years follow-up study on people who wrote it uh, and look at the uh, how anatomical those studies are according to the current system we have. And if you're more anatomical, you have less arthritis changes than the ones that are done non-anatomical. Now, arthritis changes are complex. Of course, you know, there are main reason why it happened. But I think that anatomical reconstruction is definitely one factor you have to think about, putting it in the right position. So we can measure all the things, all the things through this machine. You can look at kinematics, elongation, contact, and all the things. Uh, and uh, but we have a lot to learn. Now each patient that we do this study and X trial, it, it takes us forty hours manpower to look at each patient. This is how detailed we are. So and if I tell you our result, it truly means it. You don't say, "Wow, I think it's fine." We know exactly what it is. 40 hours for each patient, looking at the data, 40 hours, each patient, 57 patients. So again, this is complex. This is complex. Many factors, trauma, biological, kinematics, but if we will to put the wrong kinematic, but the wrong graph position, is definitely one of the factors. Now, this patient comes back at three months. It's the number one cricket player in the world from India. This is a five months post off. This is the catch of the century. So when I tell my patient that Freddie Fu can operate and feel coming in three months, no, I think it's silly because this patient is a superhuman being, superhuman being, superhuman being. He is not like a regular player. He's genetically gifted. He can come back in three months, heal fast, everything. Okay, but not everybody is like that. He's a BTP patella plus meniscus repair. Now he told the other side. And he, I said, please don't come back too early. And he, he come back in five months. Healing takes time. Look at that, it takes time over here. Six months is still high intensity. So it potentially can heal, can tear. But some people can heal fast. Some people can heal fast, so we don't know which one. For example, this is college study in Stanford. You show it two years. The graph is not 100% healed. Red is healing right here. Okay, so it's almost healed, but not quite. So maybe it healed 30, 50% and we can play. We don't know, we are still need to study about it. So patient first, anatomy important, nature. But then nature also say that every patient is not the same. So if you look at this two thing and think about a patient, you're gonna save patient money, you know, cost for money, you're gonna waste money. Now the company may not be, be happy, because it would be less making less money. But this is not what it is all, all about. Okay. So medicine is an art. It's based on scientific principle. You work with nature. 
and you look at outcome measurement. And with that, you can improve an outcome. So respect the past, embrace the future. Don't swing the pendulum too much. So right now, everybody want to do extraticular. I did the 2000 of that many, many years ago. And it's, it's okay, but it's not like the answer. Like you said, the knee is the only joint in the body. They have a crucial ligament. Those are your primary thing that allow you to rotate with formal force. So you can look at, be blinded, look at one thing, but if you open your eyes, there are many things you can learn, what to learn. Respect and preserve nature. This is Paul Galano, my hero right here. And I have many heroes from Brazil too. Many of you have taught me a lot. And look at that, this is tiny fetus knee. Look at nature, don't create nature, respect and preserve nature. So what is the ACL? Gain is dynamic, it's biological. There are bundles that work with morphology of the bone, which in the long run may be more important. There's variations and there's aging of the ACL, which by the way, I think ACL turned in two, two types. The teenage is young, and then with your 40 years old, you may turn just the AM because the PM may be not compromised too. So there are many interesting things about a cell. Lastly, you have to credit the patient. Slatin, Dr. Musel and I offer on him. This is his first go in America, as you can see. So I would give myself credit and Musel 10%. I would give the therapist 40%. I would give Slatin 50% of the credit for his return, okay? So this is what it's all about, 50%, okay? So, so only he can do it. He is a super human being. Not everybody can do it. Look at him. So this is incredible. So with that, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I really, uh, it's my privilege. And I love your country. I've been there probably 25 times. I have took my family there. Uh, Moises have took me to Pantanel. I've been to, uh, you know, Bahia, you know, with Paulo. I've been to... Corochipa with Lucy Roland. Uh, I've been to Brazil. I've been to first time I, I was in Palo Horizonte with Naina, Leila. You know, he is my first, you know, host and uh, took me, uh, you know, in the Brazilianese society. And of course, Muller Wilson and many other people. My God, I can name, I, I'm sorry, I cannot name all of you. Okay, so, so many people. Uh, Renee Abdullah and other people too. Of course, Moises is my special friend. He's a couple, you know, friends, and and we go back a long time. And uh, and uh, so so many good good people. And I want to thank you. Your culture is uh, is incredible. And I just want to warn you: be careful about this virus. Your culture is probably too friendly for the virus, like Americans. So we'll be really careful. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Fu. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions here. I don't know if uh, Gleason, that's our president, wants to talk something. No, Gleason. I forget Gleason, too. Gleason is like... <laughs> Gleason, quer falar alguma coisa para ele? Para todo mundo que está te ouvindo aí? Okay, excuse me. Hi, Dr. Fred Fu. My dear professor, I'd like the lady of the Brazilian Society of Orthopedic and Dermatology, Sbot, to thank you for the kindness and friendship you have always had with Brazilians. I wish you and your family are safe and healthy in this very special moment. Thank you, Dr. Fu. No, for thank you, Grayson. I can never forgive that I was in your house. Our professor, your... our friends. Thank you very much. Yeah, I cannot. I, I was with your house and we're dancing to the music. Yes. Uh, I, sure. I cannot never forget it. This is the best time your two sons was a little kid. Now, they're all doctors, I understand. But you are the best yes. surgeon. Unfortunately, you became the shoulder surgeon. I cannot with... teach you anymore. You can teach me everything about the shoulder. <laughs> I... I, I, I was I was observing your studies in comparative studies in then in animals. 
and I am very, very interested in study shoulders, comparative anatomic shoulders. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Fred you. Poo. I Dr. hope in the future we will dance another time in my, in my, my house uh, with the sound of Bahia, of Olodum. Thank you. Olodum, Olodum. Dr. Pu, I think you can turn, turn on your camera, then people can see you, please. Could you? And uh, Dr. Moses Cohen is also here. I don't know if he, he wants to speak something to you. Oh, oh Freddy, thank you, Mario. Oh. Ulu Don, Ulu Don, Ulu Don. <laughs> my, my dear friend, my Andrew, dear father. How are you? Hello, Mason, my good friend. And uh, Thank you Dr. So much for the you drink some wine with me. Yeah, you Andrew. That's it. A little bit drunk, all of us, but at least good wine. Good wine, good always. Fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Fred, for your talk. Mona, and I think with this virus, we cannot go anywhere. So it's good that I can stay, come and, you know, I want to I wanna be with you, you know. I want to I miss you guys, okay? Sure. Come again. We missed you. I saw you the last November. And yeah. I thank you so much. I've seen this lecture and always, always I'm learning with you. And we're all learning. And take care of yourself, your family, Hilda. And yeah. this, we we'll see you soon. And there are paper coming out from the consensus. Mario and, and is coming out now. So it's really we're good. We're going. We're going. Yeah. I stay healthy. Everybody stay healthy. More. And then, uh, Grayson. Yeah, make sure you say hi to your family and Moises too, Andrea, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fu, yes. We have some questions. I think we still have a couple more minutes. If you could enter Bruno Rohashi, was fellow Bruno, Bruno Rohashi, your, your fellow in Pittsburgh. Yes. He's asking you if you have only one choice to do research on ACL, which one would you choose? ACL anatomy? Bone morphology or extra articular procedures, or none of the both. All right, now we don't understand bone morphology yet. Right now, we are only one two dimensional. Okay, but I think in the future, I think maybe one day we can see the bone morphology and predict the ligament we need. Okay, right now, of course, we just using measurement and things like that. Of course, not extraticular. Extraticular is not. Is, is secondary restraint is secondary importance okay it's not the primary thing okay the the, the knee can be function well because of the acl allowed to rotate okay so so we have to fix the acl the best you can no question great so Bruno is also asking if you, would you consider do a, a osteotomy to correct a, a tibial slope during the acl reconstruction a tibial slope yeah well, sometimes if you need to, but don't don't crazy about slope too, because the slope there both. If you're gonna do the new two knee different slope, I don't think it's a very good idea to run. You you may have problem, you know too. So think about it. Find out what the problem is first. I mean, if you fail, if there's a reason why it failed anatomically, then then you fix it first. So yeah, I'm just telling you, I do. I would say. I get revision from all over the world, from very famous hospital, famous surgeon. And, and, and I'll give you an example. I don't want to tell you where. So I have a lady from New York, done two times. And they do the IPO operation, isometric direct fiber. And they told her she failed because she has infection. They put in antibiotics. All she does is she has a small notch. They put BDP two times and it failed. All they do is over the top. Very simple, and she is fine. So you don't have to do all the things. So if you can find a reason why it feel now, I do stop sometimes if I couldn't find any reason, okay? Not jump right away. So now in America, if you have failed ACL, it's like, oh, let's do an extra tickler, let's do a TV slope. No, why do you find out what's wrong first? Find out the reason. If you can find a reason why, then you should do it. Now all this bone morphology changes with TV slope, you can potentially change the whole kinematics on both knees. How you run, it may cause damage to other part of your body too. So I'd be very careful about it. Okay. Okay. So, 
some more questions, Dr. Uh, Jose Marques Neto asking in the high level athletes, when you, you look at the footprint, the anatomy, or what else you should take it in, in account? So what should you take? What's the factors that you look for a professional athlete to decide which kind of ACL reconstruction you will perform? As a Zlatan, for example. Oh, I think that, you know, can you look at insertion size, everybody, size wise, okay? And I think that those kind of athletes, you you tend to do something with a bone clock, maybe, with a bone clock. And I think the quad tendon with one side bone clock is good, or patella tendon. The hamstring is, is okay too, but they tend to the heal a little bit longer, take a little longer to heal. And those people are not patient. They want to come back faster. So I would, I would tend to use a bone block surgery in those if, if need to, but you still have to do the same exercise. So right now we do a little bit quad tendon a little bit more because it's a versatile. You can you do it with bone block, with a bone block, and you can measure the length. Uh, so Slata, we did the quad tendon and uh, he did well with that, with the bone block also. So, so it depends. You have to look at the patient, the, the, you have to look at the length, the size and everything to determine and talk to the patient about it. Yeah. Good, perfect. So, Evandro Rocky asking you, uh, how do you treat the HCL partial terms? For example, immobilization, a cast or a, a brace uh, for how long? Uh, how do you use a brace for partial term? I couldn't understand you. Um, he was asking how you treat a partial tear. Oh, partial tear. Okay, partial tear, of course, of course there's, uh, there are two bundles. So in one bundle tear, the question is, if the patient uh, are very athletic, you may fix the other bundle. If, if the patient is a woman, not playing too much sports, a uh, housewife, you may let that heal too. You may let some healing to occur, some observe it, but you can discuss with the patient. Um, you know, and, and like I say, well, I have some, some healing. Uh, usually they are more in 30 years old, 35 years old. They are not very athletic and they want to avoid surgery. But you can uh, tell them, don't play sports and take it easy. And uh, it may heal. Okay, but I think the MI we show you, the oblique sagittal and oblique coronal, will see it well. Because on the sagittal, you will miss the partial tear sometimes. Okay, so the sequence is written by Jeff Tao and myself. It's very simple. It takes about four more minutes to do, four more minutes MI time. It's just a computer time to do the MI. So you can see it better and follow the healing better, okay? I would say that each year I have five cases, maybe I would allow healing, five cases, five, six cases, not too many. Great. So another quick question is um, regarding the tibia fixation, atomic cell reconstruction, well bundle in which degree of flexion you fix the screw? Oh, single bundle? Or? Yeah, single bundle. I do zero to 20 degrees, somewhere like that, you know, zero to 20, something like that, you know, that range. And double bundle, I probably do 20, 20, something like that, yeah. Okay, that was a question for Rogério Carvalho. And there is another question about just, to try to. So, is this Osmar, Osmar Valadão Lopes, was your fellow. He is asking if you think that they're repairing, repairing, no, ACL repair. Repair. It's the future in ACL reconstruction. Yeah. Well, like I say, my concept of repair is to sew up the proximal part and put it to the insertion site. Okay. So, maybe you can put some fibrin cloth a little bit, but if the, if the some, it's too far away. You have to put something in there, or I may, I may also put a graph and do a remnant preservation. If you have to drill a tunnel in any way, so so to me, it's not a real repair. It's a pseudo repair. Okay, for me, a repair is really directly insertion site. So, but those are rare. So, if you want to do a semi repair, people use artificial thing and say, I can use a graph too. I don't think it's a is your choice, okay? But I personally think that you want to use biological thing and your own graph is better. But I use fibrin clone a lot. It's just simple. I know Martha Murray, 
in Boston, they use a matrix, but fibrin clot is simple. 50 cc of blood, you've been there. And you, who did a study with me? You did a study with me? Oh, no, it was, uh, it was Centop. Centop. It was fibrin, it was fibrin clot with me. So basically, fibrin clot is cheap and it works. You know, Myra Murray used whole blood. They even used PRP or stem cells, just whole blood. So all those, all those blood have things in there to allow healing, okay? Okay, great, great. So I, I have too many questions here, and uh, I, know. I think it's Possibly. too many questions to answer, and you need to, to keep talking about things. Can you email me? And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, you I'll know, <laughs> Sergio Freire is, is saying thank you for the talk. He, oh, thank you. Is Adriano Almeida, Alessandra Massi, and uh, Mar Marco Caldas. And uh, I'm so sorry I cannot answer. Uh, we, we have no time to answer other questions. No, but, no uh, but I will cool. see you all. I will meet you all of them. I will come to Brazil once this virus thing is cooled down. I couldn't wait. Perfect. I've been I've been, been traveling for six weeks, you know, a long time. I first time I've not traveled so long. Right. <laughs> I'm home every day. <laughs> uh, I take pictures. You see, I take so many pictures, you know, going crazy. <laughs> I send you pictures, right? You get it. Yeah, that's a great All right. Thank you. Dr. Poo, thank you very much. And so I'm talking about in, on behalf of uh, Isbrati, Cristiano Laurino is the president. On behalf of his thank you, thank you sir. and so thank you very much the, the entire Brazil and the our to pitch Brazilians. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. I will speak in Portuguese now. So agora o André Cardinelli vai discutir os casos aí de de dor, que é algo importante também. Às vezes o a reconstrução do LCA acaba Ocorrendo, muitas vezes tem, tem casos que são difíceis de tratar na dor no pós-operatório, não só imediato, depois de três meses, e até pacientes mais graves que ficam meses, com dois, três meses. Eu acho que o Pedrinho pode dar uma, uma boa mostragem para nós disso aí, Pedrinho. Vamos lá? Tá, o o, o, o Gleito, eu falar. Pedro Neto, Pedro Neto, dá a palavra super... primeiro para o Gleito. Se atropelar, tá? É, é só para dar um último para vocês aqui, pedir desculpas porque eu não cheguei logo no início, que eu confundi, eu achei que seria amanhã. A moça me tirou ali correndo. Mas agradecer muito ao, ao Mário Ferretti, ao Francisco Nogueira, prazer enorme, Pedro Nelly, estar com vocês. Meu querido Moisés, prazer te ver aí outra vez, né? agora junto com o Fred Ru. Agradeço muito a vocês por terem me dado essa oportunidade de estar com vocês. Muitíssimo obrigado, parabéns pelo evento de vocês. Peço licença para sair. Licença concedida, presidente. Se eu não Licença, peço, eu manda. Muito obrigado, Edson. Obrigado pelo apoio aí, em nome do Francisco também, da SEC. Obrigado. Tá. Mário, você continua controlando as perguntas, Mário? Continuo controlando as perguntas. Agora podem perguntar aqui que a gente continua. Então, o que eu acho que ah, seria interessante... A aumentou agora, Pedro. <risos> uh! é, o que eu acho que a gente podia conversar um pouquinho agora essa questão da, da dor pré-operatória, se, se a gente vê que isso tem uma relação com o que o paciente vai sentir uh, no pós-operatório. Eu gostaria de saber da nossa audiência uh, que, quem que faz algum tipo de uh, analgesia pré-operatória, se, se dá importância para isso, porque como o próprio Fred Fu falou, como tem uma grande gama de variabilidade, é uma coisa praticamente individual, né? a gente está saindo... Da, da, da cirurgia de uma para todos e, e tendo um menu de atividades, consequentemente as respostas pós-operatórias serão também diferentes, né? E a dor é o que motiva o paciente muitas vezes a fazer os procedimentos cirúrgicos, né? Vamos ver o que, que o pessoal tem para para falar aí. Se alguém já te perguntou alguma coisa ou ou não? Se ninguém perguntou, eu vou fazer uma pergunta para o Moisés. Se o Moisés dá atenção para essa questão da dor pré-operatória quando você atende seus pacientes, Moisés. Ouviu, Moisés? O telefone está mudo, Moisés. O meu? Do Moisés. 
Tá? Consegue liberar o dele? Acho que não, tá verde para todo mundo. Ouviu, Moisés? Clica no ícone do microfone, doutor Moisés. <risos> Ô Pedrinho, então enquanto o Moisés vai fazendo lá, vai tentando ver, eu vou fazer uma pergunta para você. Manda. Você faz, você acha que é importante fazer uma avaliação psicológica do, do, do paciente? É, eu acho que a questão da... isso no pós-operatório, né? Aquele paciente que Achei. às vezes é ansioso, ou às vezes que fuma, e, e, mas você faz isso? Ou alguém também, gente, pode entrar no bate-papo e falar aqui no bate-papo. É, e eu até pedi para liberar o microfone, que a gente pode pedir pro, posso pedir para o Murilo liberar o microfone de vocês. Eu estou liberado. Muito... Então, você ouviu a minha pergunta, Moisés? Ouvi, ouvi. Então, queria ah, saber a tua resposta. Em relação à dor pré-operatória, Pedri, eu acho é. que nos casos, embora a gente hoje conheça e, e as cursas desse desenvolvimento da dor, conhecimento da, do tratamento da dor, dos das, uh, protocolos multimodais, principalmente nas cirurgias maiores, na minha rotina, quando a casa é agudo, eles, eu uso a medicação analgésica, anti-inflamatória, pré-operatória. Mas é muito difícil, num caso crônico, onde o paciente não tem nenhuma dor, não tem queixa dolorosa, a gente entrar com essa medicação. Embora, academicamente, e a gente sabe que se você fizer uma terapia pré-operatória de dor, o pós-operatório vai ser melhor. Mas, em tese, para ligamento cruzado, para cirurgia grande, acho que vale a pena realmente. Para cruzado, eu acho que não seria um... No pós-operatório, no, no pré-operatório, agudo sempre, mas crônico, se não tem nenhuma dor, é difícil implementar remédio. Então, eu prefiro não dar, mas entro com o esquema pós-operatório. Tenho feito bloqueio. Uh, anestésico, fazia bloqueio femoral, tenho feito muito bloqueio agora no adutor, porque o paciente vai embora no mesmo dia, e eu estou muito satisfeito com isso, e faz uma manutenção de medicação uh, analgésica para casa. Legal. É, eu acho que essa questão do bloqueio uh, periarticular pós-operatório é bastante interessante para as primeiras uh, horas, os primeiros uh, passos depois da, da cirurgia, isso é interessante. Mário, você ia fazer uma pergunta? A minha pergunta é se você, você faz uma avaliação psicológica do paciente, o psicossocial, porque a gente vê aquele paciente mais ansioso, mas às vezes é, acaba, acaba, tendo, acaba sendo mais difícil de passar dor, de reabilitar. Então, é, se você faz alguma avaliação pré-operatória para poder fazer alguma terapia pós-operatória nesse sentido? Eu, eu acho que, assim, ninguém pede uma avaliação psicológica formal, propriamente dita, na grande maioria dos pacientes. Eu acho que a gente tem uma grande diferença de acordo com as expectativas do paciente. E elas são várias as expectativas, tanto do tempo de recuperação, da dor que ele vai ter depois. Então, o que às vezes eu vejo, quando você conversa com o paciente, você vai discutir com ele o tipo de tratamento que você vai fazer, Acho que você já come... ele já te dá uh, pistas de como ele vai se comportar no pós-operatório. Aí você já começa a inter... interceder de maneira diferente. Como o... assim, eu também não entro com medicação. Existem trabalhos que falam de você usar pregabalina, gabapentina pré-operatório para diminuir a dor no pós-operatório. Mas eu acabo só fazendo isso se aquele paciente te acende a luz e fala: esse cara aqui pode me dar problema depois. Deu, às vezes uma cirurgia mais complexa, que não só uma reconstrução ligamentar, onde você tem que associar uma extra articular, uma estrutura meniscal, alguma coisa que demanda mais, talvez sim. O que eu acho que a gente tem que entender, e isso eu acho que é uma diferença grande entre o atleta amador e o profissional, é o entorno do, do atleta. É assim, ele vai responder muito no processo de reabilitação ah, relacionado com o entorno dele. Se ele tem mais pressão, menos pressão... Se ele tem um timing, agora a gente sabe que os nossos atletas olímpicos vão ter uma folga maior até o ano que vem, mas às vezes você chega aquela pessoa que está seis meses antes do, da competição dele, que é o ápice da vida dele, aí a gente começa a ter pressões muito grandes. Então, nesse aspecto, eu acho que a gente acaba tendo que ter uma, um viés um pouquinho de psicólogo. 
Exato. É, deixa eu ver se alguém aqui fez alguma, alguma pergunta, Pedro. O pessoal está meio acanhado. O Fred Fux já ouviu a pergunta. Pô. É. é que com o Fred Fux eles vão demorar para encontrar, né? Com a gente vai encontrar no Congresso. Ô, Pedro, mas deixa eu falar. Como que você, você acaba... Por exemplo, você passa no pós-operatório no irmão de LCA, você passa tramal, tilex ou só uma lobalgia, então, você passa de inflamatório? Como que é a sua, sua rotina? Eu vou, eu, vou, eu vou compartilhar do, duas coisinhas aqui na minha tela. Deixa eu ver se, se, se você está vendo a minha tela. Não, está vendo a minha tela? Não, a gente já. Agora estou conseguindo ver ou não? Sim, sim, sim. Então, eu, eu acho que é duas coisas assim que, como o Moisés bem pontuou, a gente acaba nem sempre vendo essa questão da dor crônica. Né? Eu acho que... Uh, e, e a dor crônica, veja uma coisa interessante que a IASP, que é a Sociedade Internacional de Controlador, fala. É, é a dor que persiste após a fase de uma cicatrização de uma lesão. Então, se a gente tem um atleta que tem dor depois dos seis, nove meses de reconstrução, acho que a gente tem que encarar isso de maneira geral. Eu acho que essa questão da definição de dor crônica é importante. Por exemplo, de maneira geral, aquela dor que tem mais de três meses ou quando a gente não tem uma cicatrização. Então, é um processo crônico. Mas o que eu acho que, como você me perguntou, deveria estar correndo aqui o, o slide. Deixa eu sair aqui. Eu acho que antes da gente falar da escalinha de dor, eu, eu acho que uma coisa importante é a gente ter essa definição ou diferenciação dos tipos de dor. Que eu, eu sei que é uma coisa que é um pouquinho árida para o ortopedista, mas porque a maioria das dores que a gente trata é, no nosso consultório, principalmente as pós-operatórias, são dores de característica mista. Onde você tem uma dor que está com um estímulo que depende, então, por exemplo, a própria reabilitação, se você acerta mais, você carrega a mão ela pode te dar um estímulo que provoca mais dor, mas você pode ter uma dor neuropática associada, que de acordo com aquilo que você falou da parte psicológica do paciente, como ele interpreta, você está sujeito a uma amplificação central. Então, não é incomum, às vezes, quando a gente faz cirurgia do, do cruzado anterior, a gente tem alguma lesãozinha de nervinho sensitivo periférico, a gente cursa com uma pequena uh, analgesia numa área. Então, é assim, essa quando acontece isso, ele já pula na dor nociceptiva, onde você tem nervos intactos, para essa dor neuropática, que tem nervo danificado. Então, aí você tem que é, calibrar isso. E aí eu acho que a gente tem que correr é, para aquela escalinha, esca, escadinha de dor. Deixa eu ver se entra aqui, estou com dificuldade de entrar o, o slide seguinte. Deixa eu ver se ele entra aqui. Tá? Então, de maneira geral, essa escadinha aqui é o que eu acho que a gente tem que se basear. Porque ela dá uma escala de complexidade da dor. Mas é bem citou, a gente começa geralmente aqui, né? Analgésico leve, anti-inflamatórios não hormonais. E uh, como é que a gente faz normalmente uma prescrição pós-operatória? Você prescreve isso aqui de rotina e aí você põe aqui e se é necessário. Aqui eu já acho que entra uma coisa que a gente tem que entender um pouquinho melhor, a faixa etária e o gênero do paciente. Tá? Principalmente porque os opioides têm ações muito diferentes nas pessoas de mais idade e a questão da obstipação no sexo feminino é bastante importante. Eu acho que se você tem a tendência de usar um opioide no, no pós-operatório, acho que vale a pena conversar com a, com a mocinha se ela é uma pessoa mais obstipada ou não. Se você prevê que você teve mais mais lesões que você causou para o paciente, fora a lesão principal, aí você vai caminhar para drogas que são mais potentes. E com isso você tem uma melhor uh, um melhor tratamento da dor. O que eu acho que é uma, um conceito muito importante é não esperar ter a dor para tratar a dor. O que acontece? De maneira geral, o, o, o paciente, você fala para ele, toma se você tiver dor. Ele vai ficar uns 40, 50 minutos, ah, isso aqui é dor, não é dor, é dor, não é dor. Quando começa a impactar isso para ele, ele resolve tomar o remédio. Aí esse remédio vai ter, agir 30, 40 minutos depois, uma hora depois. 
ele quase ficou três horas tendo dor. Então, eu acho que quando você é, prevê que ele vai ter um quadro de dor maior, ou quando você vai começar a manipulação, tudo, já faz a cobertura antecipadamente. Porque você de, diminui a hiperestação cerebral. Principalmente na dor de origem neuropática, você consegue resultados melhores quando você profilaticamente trata da dor do paciente. Então, isso é uma combinação. Você entende como é o seu processo pós-operatório. Se você é uma pessoa que gosta de um protocolo mais agressivo, se aquele seu paciente tolera mais ou menos a uh, agressividade no pós-operatório, você tem que calibrar a dor, uh, o, o analgésico que você dá para o paciente. Aí, uh, o que eu gosto de falar assim, uh, age antes dele ter a dor. Se a gente age antes da dor, a gente consegue minimizar esse quadro geral do, do paciente. Acho que é mais importante isso daí, entendeu? Não sei o que, que vocês acham, se alguém quer fazer algum comentário. Não, perfeito. Eu acho que está bem colocado, Felipe. Deixa eu, eu ver aqui. Eu acho que o pessoal aqui não, não tem, ninguém tem nenhuma dúvida, não. Sr. Moisés, você quer colocar algo mais? Peraí, deixa eu ver o microfone também já aqui. Não, eu acho Olha, que o Pedro, Pedro foi muito bem. Uma das coisas que... Dois, dois, só duas colocações. Primeiro que nós, ortopedistas, no geral, nós temos medo de usar, muitas vezes, a medicação analgésica uh, mais forte. Esse é um ponto. Uh, segundo, que nós acabamos perdendo esse espaço, uh, delegando isso para o anestesista, para os especialistas em dor, e a maior queixa que pode existir dentro da ortopedia, seja de qual for a especialidade, é dor. Nada é pior do que dor, nada é mais frequente do que queixa de dor em ortopedia. E, em terceiro, eu acho que nós, ortopedistas, temos que parar. Eu aprendi isso é, realmente vendo aulas de dor e participando. É acabar de, de, de ter aquele negócio. Tomar, tarará, se tiver dor, se necessário. Eu acho que isso que o Pedro falou é muito apropriado. Então, hoje, por exemplo, voltou à tona o uso da dipirona. Então, o lisador voltou à tona total. Eu uso, tenho usado de rotina como primeira opção de analgesia. E depois, a utilização da outra medicação, essa coisa de colocar se necessário, se dor, eu acho que isso tem que acabar um pouco. A gente tem que ser mais incisivo, faz o protocolo, mesmo que ele ainda não tenha dor, dê o remédio, isso vai evitar aquilo que o Pedrinho falou. A hora que isso estiver registrado, a hora que chegou lá em cima a dor, para você fazer ela desaparecer, você vai ter muito mais trabalho. Então, acho que isso é uma mudança de posição, uma, uma quebra de paradigma para a gente mesmo, porque ele mexe de receitar. Vou tomar cada três horas, cada seis horas, se tiver dor. Então, acho que não é se tiver dor, é usar o remédio próprio na hora certa, mas usar, não deixar o paciente começar a ter a dor. Estou de pleno acordo, Pedrinho. Beleza, eu acho que é importante a gente não deixar o cérebro ficar hiper excitado com isso, ok? Depois a gente vai ganhar, e quando a gente tem a presença de dor, a dor retarda o crescimento e a incorporação de massa muscular. Então a gente tem dificuldade de ganho no pós-operatório com as coisas. Então, acho que assim, a gente tem que a obrigação de controlar a dor de uma maneira mais intensa nesse nosso pós-operatório. Eu vejo dessa maneira. Fala, Marião. Não, acho que está tá bem colocado, quer dizer, é, só eu, eu perguntei da parte psicológica, mas a gente faz pouco, né? Tem o pessoal da, da, da Escandinávia lá, os, os suecos, e, e eles acabam fazendo um questionário, o RSI, para avaliação meio psicológica do paciente, para poder também, pré-operatoriamente, saber o tipo e poder controlar isso durante a reabilitação. Eu, quando a gente pega um atleta profissional, sem profissional, isso aí não tem problema nenhum, esses caras vão bem pra caramba. Mas é aquele cara que opera na sexta e segunda-feira vai pro escritório, começa o dia a ficar inchado e às vezes começa a ficar uma dor mais, mais, mais difícil. Mas é, é, eu acho que foi tudo bem colocado. Queria agradecer até agora, ainda tem 150 pessoas aí assistindo, até agora há pouco tempo tinha 190. A resistência. Zerose da resistência. É, então, agradecer, agradecer mais uma vez a, em nome do Cristiano Laurindo, presidente da Esbrat, para a Esbrat, 
o Francisco Nogueira da SEC, né, o Gleison já saiu, o doutor Moisés é como peço presidente, né, o presidente, o ex-presidente do ano passado. Então, agradecer a todos, essa é uma primeira reunião de uma série de reuniões que a SEC vem fazendo. A SEC ainda vai ter mais duas com esprate, vai ter com trauma, vai ter com joelho, vai ter com ombro. Então, com todos os comitês. Então, lógico que a gente quarentena cabe logo, mas esses webinars vão continuar. Então, agradecer a presença de todos, mesmo a participação de todos. E muito obrigado. Até a próxima. Obrigado. Parabenizar a todos pela ação. Mário, o Cristiano, que é o nosso presidente da Esbrat esse ano, eu acho que essa essa questão educacional é sempre muito importante, sempre foi uma característica nossa da Esbrat olhar sempre, ter esse olhar educacional para todo mundo. Muito obrigado, boa noite. Obrigado, Mário, obrigado, Pedri, parabéns ao Cristiano Esbrat, parabéns à SEC pela iniciativa, eu acho que isso veio para ficar, né? independente de Covid, tenho certeza que essa, essa cultura de, de tele, de webinar, eu acho que isso veio para ficar. Parabéns a todos e uma boa noite. Boa, boa noite. noite, boa noite.